Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. There are blessings here for you to get, and I hope you get every single blessing that God has for you. If you're watching on Facebook, would you click the like and share button? And if you're watching on YouTube, you can share the link directly with some friends. Let's take a breath and pray together over this time. Jesus, we ask you to bless this time. We ask you to bless the technology. We ask you to open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today. Let us be able to hear the message and receive it into our hearts. Give us truth that maybe we didn't realize yet through the preaching of your word. And Lord, let us have a sweet time of worship with the worship time this morning. Father, please grow your church here on earth and use us to help be a blessing to the lost and hurting world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship. Let faith arise In spite of what I see, Lord, I believe But help my unbelief, I choose to trust you No matter what I see, let faith arise Let faith arise my champion's not dead, he is alive And he already knows my every need But surely he will come and rescue me God of miracles come We need your supernatural love to break through nothing's impossible for the God of miracles let faith arise I see the kingdom come I lift my eyes the battle has been won my God is faithful and every single word he said is This world is shaking, but you cannot be shaken. My heart is breaking, but I'm not broken yet. Your love is fearless. Help me to be courageous too. Because there's nothing impossible. This world is shaking, but you would not be shaken. And my heart is breaking, but I'm not broken yet. Your love is fearless. Help me to be courageous too. There's nothing impossible for the God of miracles. Come, we need your supernatural love to break through. Nothing's impossible for the God of miracles. If God miracles, God of miracles come, we need your supernatural love to break on through. Nothing's impossible for the God of miracles.
Well, welcome back to our series, Standing Strong in a Wicked World, and it is a study through the book of Daniel. And now we are in the later chapters of Daniel, chapter 10. And chapter 10 is deep into the second half of Daniel, which is way different than the first half of Daniel. The first half of Daniel is all our favorite Daniel stories, like the fiery furnace, the handwriting on the wall, the, the lion's den, the dreams, the statues, Nebuchadnezzar. Second half of Daniel, which is what we're well into now, is all apocalyptic dreams. And it's filled with dreams and visions about the rise and falls of kingdoms, uh, prophecy concerning the end times, and in this case, angelic visits. So it's an exciting adventure as we get into chapter 10, um, but it's a spiritual adventure. And like I said, there's angelic uh, visits and, and talk of angelic warfare. So sometimes it could be a little bit mysterious, um, but it's really important that we remember that it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God to us. And even though it was written 2,500 years ago, it gives us excellent insight about spiritual warfare that takes place in our lives every day, even these days. So let's dig right into Daniel chapter 10, starting with verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine. Touched, nothing touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. All right, so he's talking about the year of Cyrus, king of Persia. This is a, a very important conqueror. He was a Persian conqueror who conquered Media, which... We don't think about it much, but Media was a huge landmass uh, in the Middle East from the eastern part of the Persian Gulf all the way north of the Indian Ocean, a massive landmass all the way to India. And Cyrus is the Persian king conqueror who conquers all of that, uh, who, who had that already conquered Babylon. So it's all of Media, all of Babylonia is in his grip at this point. So that's the king we're talking about. Now he was a good king, a uh, good conqueror, because he was the one that returned the Jews. He's, he was one that edict, issued the edict of Cyrus that says the Jews should just be able to go back to their homeland and rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. All right, so this is the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now Daniel's now in about, he's probably in his mid-80s at this point, and he's given this vision and message in this chapter, and it's a message of great conflict um, that's been recorded for us in this chapter, and also it'll be in the final two chapters of Daniel, 11 and 12. And it's a message of war between nations and coming persecution for the Israelites. But as previously mentioned, it also shows us the behind the scenes of what's going on in this spiritual warfare. So it begins, as we just read, Daniel is mourning for three weeks. Um, he was fasting at this point. We don't know why he's mourning or why he's fasting, but it was during this time of morning fasting and prayer that he was given this message, this vision. In chapter 10, now we're in verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Scholars debate the identity of this being, this man, someone that was like a man, uh, incredibly imposing, great person being that had all this incredible ornate clothing, if you will, the, the gold belt, the body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, uh, dr dressed in linen, he, he, his legs were like burnished bronze, all this stuff. Now, people say this could be what we call a Christophany or uh, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, others believe it's an angel or maybe one of the archangels. Um, I tend to go with the angel on this one. I, I think he's perhaps even an archangel and perhaps even Gabriel. Just this time he wasn't given his name. Maybe an unnamed angel that we don't know. And here's why. He says later this being... He struggled with spiritual forces in Persia, and he, was, he would have been overcome if Michael hadn't come to his rescue. So it wasn't, I don't believe this was Jesus. I don't think Jesus would have had to have assistance to struggle against the dark forces. 
But some people believe that this is a form of Christ. All right, Daniel 10, verse 7. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. And then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. <laughs> I know what that's like, because sometimes I, I go speak to people and speak at churches and people fall in a deep sleep sometimes their face to the ground no that's not true but i can't imagine this incredible being speaking to daniel and he fell asleep and you'll notice at any time in scripture when an angel appears um, there's an overwhelming sense of fear usually the first thing they say is do not be afraid or fear not and daniel as godly as he was this vision of this angelic being left him deathly pale. He be probably fainted is what happened. And he's helpless with his face to the ground. So he fell into a deep sleep or very likely fainted. I don't think he just got um, you know, fatigued and weary and dreary and fell asleep. And Chris, the scripture doesn't tell us for how long he slept. It may have been a while. But then, verse 10, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up. For I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. And then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you sent your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to them. Okay, so that uh, he's, he's fainted from fear, <laughs> in my opinion. And then a hand touches him and lifts him up. And can you imagine how fearful he is then? He's, now he's lifted him up onto his knees, then his feet, and he's told he's highly esteemed. And, and he says that from the moment you started praying, your words were heard and I've come as a result of them. And that's really interesting because he came as a result of Daniel's prayers, but not right away. We'll see that in just a second. And I believe this is when we do what Daniel did, when we do that, when we set our mind to gain understanding, in other words, seek his wisdom, and then we humble ourselves before God he hears our words and he responds to them. And this angel said he had heard the request on the first day of this 21 day period, but was delayed in response to them. So this gives us a glimpse of some of the angelic warfare that takes place because the angel is about to say he was delayed by the prince of Persia and the king of Persia. All right, so let's get into it. Verse 13, but the prince of Persia, or the prince of the Persian kingdom, resisted me 21 days. And then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. And now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Now this is such a remarkable uh, insight, very unique in the Bible, because it gives us a, a glimpse into the angelic realm. And when we look at this passage, and the, this angel, and I'm going to call it an angel or an archangel, was restricted from getting to Daniel for 21 days because of another prince or angel, if you will, of Persia resisted him and blocked his way. And it's only when the archangel Michael, who is called the chief, one of the chief princes, arrived that this angel was able to get through to Daniel. So what's all this with princes and, and Michael and angels? See, angels are unique and they're very mysterious beings in the Bible. There's not one chapter that gives us a whole outline of everything you need to know about angels. So we, we, we see them appear all through scripture and we learn from each of those appearances what they are like. And they show up throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Usually they show up to provide assistance or guidance or bring a message uh, you know, some of the messages like the Annunciation, Jesus' birth, and other things were brought forth by the angel. And in Daniel, they're sometimes called one who looked like a man, or sometimes called a prince, or are recognized for the names that they are, like Gabriel was listed, and Michael here is listed. And Michael and Gabriel are considered archangels by most scholars. Um, some scholars go beyond just the 66 books of the Bible, uh, particularly Catholic scholars and some Jewish scholars, and they also include Raphael, who is an angel that's, rec uh, that's mentioned, archangel, in the book of Tobit. But they're also beyond angels, and many of them don't have names. We don't, we don't know their names, I should say. Um, so for the thousands of angels that are listed, 
uh, in the Bible, we only know a few of their names. But there's also fallen angels. And one of them, we do know his name, and that is Lucifer, believed to be one of the archangels. Lucifer, who we now call Satan or the devil. And also his demons and some of his names, their names are listed like Apollyon and Abaddon uh, in different parts of scripture. And uh, they're also called princes. And just as Satan is called the prince of the power of the air or the ruler of darkness, sometimes they're referred to not just angel of the power of the air or angel of darkness, but ruler or prince of darkness. And then we know that there's more than 20 interactions between humans and angels in, in, this, in the Gospels alone. So let me just give you some examples as we learn a little bit about angels. Uh, number one, there are children's guardian angels. And I'm not sure that it's just for children. It might be for everyone. But think about what, Ma what Jesus said in Matthew 18, 10. He's, he's saying, you know, let the children come to me. And then he says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Their angels. How about undercover angels? Undercover angels. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without even knowing it. Angels unaware. And then what about ministering angels? Jesus, when he was tempted by the devil for 40 days, um, in Matthew 4:11, it says, Then the devil left him, and angels came and ministered to him. He had been fasting and being tempted for 40 days. Angels came and ministered to him. So the prince of Persia that is detaining our angel here in Daniel 10 is most likely a demon or a fallen angel that had been assigned to the Medo-Persian Empire, perhaps Persia, to influence it toward evil. Now, it's obviously a powerful angelic being because it could prevent the other messenger angel from getting through to Daniel. He wanted to come earlier. This angel detained him. But notice that Michael, who was called one of the chief princes, and that's right there in Daniel 10, 13, one of the chief princes, he's the only, uh, you know, he was able to come to his aid and, and help. He's not, only, he's not the only one. See, he's of higher order of some of the other angels. Angels have authority and power. That's why one of them might be called the chief prince. Um, so this is why this angel that we're talking about, the Daniel 10 angel, I don't believe it's Jesus because I don't believe he's of lower order than Michael. All right, but, but this is incredible that we see this angelic activity. Let's keep going. Verse 15. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. The one who looked like a man touched my lips and opened my mouth and began to speak. As I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I'm helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return and fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. And that's how, the, uh, that's how this chapter ends with half a parenthetical statement. You know, open parentheses, and then there's no closed parentheses. <clears throat> I'm not sure why, but the rest of that statement is in Daniel 11, verse 1. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Okay, so that's how it ends. Now, it also talks about the book of truth. Now, some people think it may be the Bible, but the Bible really wasn't written. There was the Torah, and there were the writings, and there was the prophets, so it's possible. Uh, but some also believe that there are things written in heaven that angels are aware of that we are not. But this chapter gives us deep insight into spiritual warfare. And I want to say this. <clears throat> it's not just spiritual warfare that took place in the time of Daniel. It's spiritual warfare that continues. Now, as we know, the spiritual warfare is sometimes reflected in the physical warfare. For instance, the Greeks eventually did come and eventually did conquer Persia. And yet, all this time, we see angelic 
beings doing battle uh, in these unseen realms. So you have what's physical on the earth and you could see it, but then even more important is this overarching battle that takes place in a heavenly realm that we don't see. Now, I have a question. Do you think there's demonic angels stationed in cities today? Well, I know that there's demonic activity in cities today. There's evil influences in th throughout the world. I'm not sure, however, if they recognize city limits. I'm not sure if they stay in certain townships or if they're stationed to certain uh, municipalities, but they are definitely active. Demonic influencers are definitely active in influencing the souls of men, especially in areas where people are resistant to the word of God. See, if they're resistant to the word of God, these demonic forces of deception and, and demonic evil have a power over them because they have, these people that are resisting the word of God have no power within them. They don't have the truth. And especially when people are resistant to Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, the, the demons have a heyday in countries, nations that are that way, and in cities that are that way, cities that block out any influence of, of the Holy Spirit or through the word of God you can feel it's, the evil is almost palpable. And, and it's when people are resistant to God's presence, the devil swoops right in. And there, there's demonic warfare taking place. And guess what? Most of those demons were, are winning battles, left and right, in areas that people surrender territory to them. And you could sense it. Now, is there, is there uh, the presence of, of godly angels in certain cities? And, evil say you know all i can say is this is that in, it's in groups of people and when groups of people are honoring god and adhering to his word and praying then obviously the 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 angelic support is strong but when they are not or or even more so when they're resistant to god then the demonic support and activity is 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 prevailing you take a walk sometime from Ocean Grove, New Jersey to Asbury Park, <clears throat> just a few hundred feet away. They're, they're butt up against each other and then walk back. Tell me what you feel in your spirit. One is an area that's completely committed, or had been completely committed from its inception to the glorification of Jesus. And the other has become a place where they have shunned and shut out uh, as a godly influence in many areas. And you could just feel it. So the message of this chapter for us is that spiritual battles take place all around us, whether we're aware of them or not. They don't check in with us. They happen whether we are aware or not. Now, we may not know everything there is to know about them, like what are warring angels, what are messenger angels, which of them are, are demons. And, and, but we don't know all there is to know about them, but we do know this. We do know who has authority over all of these things all of them, power over all of them, God. And he's given us all we need to be victorious even in the spiritual warfare that we face every day. Yeah, we can be victorious in spiritual warfare. Let's go right to Ephesians 6. Because Paul is telling these Christians who live in a very dark spiritual environment, Ephesus, come on, this is a, a demonic city powerful demonic city how can they be strong in that how can they prevail in that city here's how he says this in ephesians 6 10 through 18 finally be strong in the lord in his mighty power put on the full armor of god so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in heavenly realms, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. 
This is the formula for spiritual warfare success, for victory. Every day when you wake up, and before your, even, your feet even hit the floor, there is demonic warfare being waged against you. <laughs> and that includes schemes, which are carefully laid out plans. That includes traps and deceptions and fiery darts that can expose your weak spots. Now, on our own, we're, we're helpless against this. But through God's power, we are more than conquerors. So how can we have victory in spiritual warfare based on, on what we see here in Ephesians 6? Three ways. Number one, it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Don't try to achieve victory based on your mighty power, your own mental fortitude, your own self-determination. Admit that you're weak and let him, his strength take effect. 2 Corinthians 12, 10, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So we recognize our frailty and our inability and we open ourselves to God and we say, God, you do it. I yield, you take over. Number two, put on the full armor of God. It was listed here. Helmet of salvation, are you saved? Breastplate of righteousness, do you recognize Jesus imputed righteousness to us? Or are you trying to achieve it on your own? The belt of truth, do you act truthfully? truthfully with God, with yourself, with others. Feet shod or fitted with the readiness of the gospel. Are you ready to share the gospel? And do you know how to share the gospel? Do you have a message prepared, ready to share the gospel? Sword of the Spirit, that is the word of God. Do you study it? Do you know it? Do you use it? Do you live it? And then the shield of faith. Faith is trust Trust in motion is belief. Belief in motion is called believing. Do you really believe in God as the creator of all the earth? As Jesus, who, who's lived a sinless life and yet died and rose again so that our sins could be forgiven and we can have eternal life. Do you really, really believe that? Because if you don't, you have no shield and you'll be exposed. That was it, number two. Put on the full, arm, full armor of God. And then the third one. Again, right here from Ephesians 6, pray. Pray. That's what he says at the end of all the, all the full armor of God. He says in 18, verse, uh, Ephesians 6, 18, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. We don't know the power that we have in prayer. We forget because otherwise we'd be praying way more. The enemy is always trying to convince us that there's no power in prayer. You're just reciting words to the air. It doesn't mean much because he knows how strong it is. And, and remember what that angel said. You know, I've come to you because of your words. Um, when I was uh, young, young, I used to tell, ask my dad to tell me war stories. And he was a World War II veteran, and he fought in France during World War II, landed on Normandy, but he made it known it wasn't during D-Day. It was six months later, so the beach had already been taken. But he would talk about those who, who gave their lives on that fateful day, which is 80 years ago, um, on D-Day. And, and they fell into this lethal trap. And he talked about the Allies' failure to what he called soften the beaches. I think there was some communication, miscommunication. They didn't soften all the beaches of Normandy and Juneau and, and uh, Omaha. Uh, but they, they, so they failed to soften the beaches. He, he used that term. And what that means, soften the beaches, is that before the troops are invading and before these, these ships and boats land on the beach, the army or the uh, air force, perhaps the allied forces, would bombard the beaches with you know, bombs and missiles so that the artillery and maybe even the, the, the um, troops on the, on the beach would be annihilated particularly the traps and, and things like that. So we, they'd soften the beaches. So by the time they got there, they were able to prevail and be more successful and not lose as many men. That's what prayer does. Prayer softens the beaches of spiritual territory. When you wanna, you're going out to do some type of ministry, some type of um, uh, activity that's, that you'll be engaging in spiritual warfare, pray. When we go out to do ministry on the streets or on the boardwalks, we always pray first, soften the beaches. So when we get there, we are it is prepared. The environment is prepared. Angels, we're dispatching angels on our behalf through our prayers. That's what, what they respond to. Remember what we read in Daniel 12, 
Remember Daniel 10, verse 12. He said to me, do not fear, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I come because of those words. We don't know what kind of angelic activity that we dispatch and release through our prayers. The angel was dispatched because of Daniel's prayer. We never know what effect our prayers have here on earth, nor do we know what they have in the heavenly realms. Yet we're locked in a fierce spiritual battle. But do not fear. Do not fear. Yes, there's spiritual activity, warfare going on all around us, but do not fear. You know why? Because if God is for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors and nothing can separate us from his love. How do I know this? Because the Bible clearly tells it, and I believe it. Let's just read where it says it in closing. Romans 8, 31, and then 37 through 39. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height or death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I believe this. I hope that you do too. God bless you. separate even if I ran away your love never fails I know I still make mistakes you have new mercies for me every day your love never Stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails And the water deep. I'm not alone.
here in these open seas Cause your love never fails The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side But your love never fails Friend, thank you for tuning in, joining us here online with North Shore Fellowship's online service. I hope that you enjoyed the worship. I hope you enjoyed the word. I hope that you listen to some of those announcements and will respond and come out to some of our many events that we have coming up. They're for you. They're for you and us to, to connect together, and I'd love to see you. But most importantly, I hope that you know Jesus personally. I hope that you've come to a point where you've given him your life. And if you have not, then today is the day for that reach out to me. I will respond right away. I'll pray a prayer with you that will lead you into a firm foundation of your salvation. You need that for today. You need it for your eternity, and it'll be the best prayer that you've ever prayed. God bless you.